Welcome into the Wash Up Walk Ons podcast, episode 163 of the show. Uh, it's me. It's me alone. There is no Drake or Kevin. Now, how many of you just automatically left? Hopefully, not that many. Kluver's annoying. This guy sucks. He, he's the nerdy long snapper that just does the podcast. He's the tech guy. Kevin and Drake are the talent, yada, yada. Sorry, they're not here. Drake. That's the casino. He's doing his work. And Kevin, who we pushed the podcast back for and usually do because he has a the most legitimate job of the three of us, he just hasn't responded uh, to the text message, which is abnormal. Is Kevin okay? I told Drake I'm just going to assume that he died on the job and I'm going to have to rip it alone. Drake was mad at some guy who was getting super lucky at the poker table and would not leave because he was convinced that this guy was dumb money, a fish, as they call them. And he wanted to, he did not want to leave that table for the opportunity at some point to take money from that guy. So it is Tyler Kluver, your former polecat long snapper from 13 to 17, doing it alone today. I promise you, if you stay here, it's going to be a short, sweet, to the point, facts podcast. I'm not going to go into long details about stuff. I'm not going to try and tell stories. I'm, I'm going to be as, as least annoying as I can for y'all. And hopefully when stuff like this happens, you guys can kind of stick around and, and you know, 20 minutes, listen to my thoughts. I'm going to talk about if... I still think Petrus is the guy or not and, and how that dynamic is going to play out the rest of this season and the off season. I'm going to talk about Goodson. I'm going to talk about the defense. I'm going to give all of my thoughts. So if you care about what I think and you need 20 minutes to just relax or who knows, maybe you throw it on two X speed and you just knock it out in 10 minutes. You get to say, you listen to the podcast. You haven't missed one. There you go. I, We'll repeat many of the things for the Patreon subscribers that uh, did the that get to listen to the instant reaction. First off, the Hawks end up winning the game, thirty-five to seven. I did not think that this was going to be the case. I personally did not even like Iowa to cover the three-point line. The first two games scared the hell out of me, like many fans in the Iowa Hawkeye fan base, and. I was not sure if the game last week was more because Iowa was finding a groove or because Michigan State was god-awful. Now, we know that Michigan State is god-awful, and in fact, the entire state of Michigan is god-awful. One of the things I was excited to talk about tonight with Drake and Kevin was, uh, for those listening, I don't know if you caught the Michigan-Wisconsin game, big game on the, uh, on the night slot. On Saturday, Michigan, Wisconsin, the Badgers roll into the big house and absolutely dominate the maize and blue. I believe that's what they're called. Um, 49 to 11, I believe the final score was. Wisconsin looking like they do often. Michigan looking like something that I have not seen in my lifetime. Well, that's probably not true, but since I can remember, since I was paying attention, high school, 2009 to present, I have not seen a Michigan team look like this. Michigan is supposed to be a blue blood, Harbaugh, khaki pants, okay? They know it all. They're, the, they're, one, you know, they're one of the schools in the Big Ten. They have now... Their, their win over Minnesota, which we'll get to hear talking about in a second, now that Iowa has pounded Minnesota, looks way less good to open up the season. In-state loss against Michigan State, and now um, just absolutely gets handled by the Badgers. And the Badgers are good. Wisconsin's good. They had two weeks off. That's good in a lot of ways. Players are well-rested, not that they had anything that they were beat down from. They had played one game to open up the season against a poor Illinois team who ends up pulling a win off against Rutgers this, this weekend. But Wisconsin looked like the front runner of the West. Still in it, by the way. 
just need six games. It's going to be real interesting. They, and I need to pull up if they, I can't remember who their two games were that got canceled, but I don't know if Northwestern was one of them or not. It's not Northwestern wasn't because they're four and oh. So the West is basically between Northwestern and Wisconsin. Northwestern upending Purdue 27 20 this weekend. One of Kevin's bets was a minus three bet on Northwestern. He called it his lock. That covered. Kevin made fun of me for my Notre Dame pick over Boston College. They covered. My other pick was Wisconsin minus six against Michigan. Blew that out of the water. So I was 2-0 and this weekend. Kevin can suck it. But... The, I mean, the East is completely turned on its head. Indiana will take on Ohio State this weekend. If you're listening to this the week it comes out for essentially the East title. Whoever wins that is going to be the first place team uh, in the Big Ten Championship. Taking on most likely, it's not 100% yet, but taking on most likely the winner of the Northwestern Wisconsin game. I don't know if Wisconsin, the way that Wisconsin played against Michigan I, is, 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 again, one of those things where I don't know if it's Wisconsin's that good and Michigan's that bad or, or Wisconsin's that good or Michigan's that bad. Similar to, I don't know if Iowa is actually a lot better than we thought after the first two games or is Minnesota and Michigan State that bad. Usually there's not this weird gap right like you can kind of um similar common common foes common opponents you can kind of look across games okay michigan beat minnesota so if iowa plays iowa beat minnesota too you know they both handled them pretty good iowa plays michigan they should be a tight game you should sometimes you know usually you can do that but i don't know if you can do that this year because games have been so far apart. Wisconsin only played two and both the teams are trash. So is Wisconsin even good? I don't know. Wisconsin's, I mean, I know this Penn state loses again. As I said, the, the East is on, is turned upside down. Other than Ohio state, you have Indiana. You have, I mean, not that, Purdue or uh, Maryland and Rutgers are not, you know, I wouldn't call them better than Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, but Min, uh, Michigan is one and two, one and three. Uh, let me pull this up just a second. So you're going to get a little bit of the action of how this works on the instant reaction. I'm going to talk to you guys as we stall, but we, we, we just saw Penn State lose to the Huskers. Let's talk about that one real quick. I was I, I had multiple people say, hey, who are you cheering for in this one? Because I don't want either person to win. And neither did I. I wanted Penn State to keep losing. And if it was somehow possible, I wanted Nebraska to also keep losing. <laughs> Obviously, and if they would have tied, it would have been like, that would have been ideal, right? I saw a hilarious tweet that was from maybe a Nebraska journalist that said that this was the biggest win. I believe it's a, it's the 10th win for Scott Frost in Lincoln, and they're calling it his biggest, most important win to date. To bring his Nebraska team his third year Nebraska team to one and two against an Owen four Penn state. And they almost blew it in the second half. Luke McCaffrey looked great in the first half. In fact, the entire Nebraska team looked really pretty good in the first half. I think, uh, you know, it's one of those situations where it's, it's almost You'd like to think it's a similar situation in Iowa City. I don't, here's the issue, and we're going to get to that in a second. I don't think if Spencer Petrus is our Adrian Martinez, 
and he's not he's not Adrian Martinez in any kind of the sense. But if he's our Adrian Martinez, our starter, I don't know if we have a Luke McCaffrey to bring in to really provide that spark, is what they would call it. Um, they looked energized. They looked tough. They looked excited to play. Squeaked it out. They only scored three points in the second half. They looked like a, they looked like a week one, week two Iowa team out there. Twenty seven in the first half. Let let Penn State make it uh, real interesting. Will, in fact, both teams playing a backup quarterback. Kind of the theme here. Will Levis of Penn State came in and he provided a spark for them. A dual threat. Um, Penn State is, is not good. And that's actually who the Hawks will be taking on on Saturday. We go to Happy Valley. It's a much different Happy Valley than it was when I walked in there in 2016. One of the most intense big time environments that I've ever been in. And I think the boys would echo that. Oh, and three Penn state walks into Lincoln, no fans, no hype, no nothing. And they let the little red toss them around the field. And it's Nebraska's self-proclaimed biggest victory under Scott Frost. I'll tell you what, if that's, if that's true, and I don't know there, it very well may be. It's just hard to believe that your biggest win is against an 0-3 team. They have a long, long way to go. But I think they're showing signs. I think they're showing signs of what you see when a coach gets his recruiting classes into the program. And maybe more than ever, not that I pay attention to the national scene like I could in this sense. They've been pretty open about, hey, we're going to weed Mike Riley's guys out. And my guys are going to come in. My, my, me being Scott Frost, I'm going to get my guys in here. And then we're going to start playing ball. They're going to want to play for me. They're going to be recruited by me. I want guys who are going to, who are willing to play and play my style, fit my culture. Nebraska looks to be on the way there. I said this similarly, and I wish I would have clipped this for here. Last year, Minnesota goes 11 and two and third year in the program for PJ Fleck. Third year. I think so. Finally got a couple of his guys in there. I've been a proponent of PJ Fleck on this, on this podcast. I'm a proponent of Scott Frost. And more so than the two coaches, I'm a bigger proponent of letting coaches have a chance, have a shot. In every fan base around the country, you're going to find the vocal minority. And in some places, it may be the vocal majority. You may, you know, it may simmer uh, into a situation where more than half, you know, the majority of the fan base and everyone else wants the head coach gone. But usually it's the vocal minority. Always the case with Kirk Ferentz. Every fan base is going to have that group of people that say, we need a new coach. We need to go a different direction. And obviously you just, you just let those people talk and you don't listen to them. But with Scott Frost, you know, what he did at UCF. A lot of Nebraska fans expected that to happen in Nebraska. This isn't the 90s. Talk about it all the time. It's tough to win in the Big Ten, no less, where they aren't fitting in well, just as a Big Ten team. They have now 10 wins in three seasons, 10 wins in 25 games. So Scott Frost is 40%, not great. Especially in a comp, in a, in a, in a side of a, a Big Ten West that doesn't have a top to bottom lineup of heavy hitters. 
but I think you give Scott Frost another two years. What can Scott Frost do in year four and then in year five? You have to see improvement. I think in year four, you have to be six and six. You have to win half your games. Who knows if they play a normal schedule next year, but you have to be. Scott Frost's hot seat truly begins, in my eyes, if he does not win six games next year. Tough because we're thrown in the COVID year. And it's like, well, is this year count? Is what, what is this year even? By year five, you have to have a winning record or else you, the legit, there's legitimacy behind the argument of should you be the coach? Because now you have an entire program, five recruiting classes worth of your guys. Your first recruiting class has run the race. They're seniors. So now top to bottom, the culture, even the entire culture, even year four, you could argue that this, the seniors that are, have stuck around and are in their fifth year are still the, the, the horses in the front of that pack. They're leading the culture. But year five, you have no excuses. It's, it's entirely your team. So... They're in the middle of that five-year span, and I think I think they're on their way. I said that P.J. Flack in year three would have Minnesota contending for the West. And he did. More, more than contended for the West. Looks like they've regressed a little bit. I'm really, I'm really curious uh, to dive deeper into that in the offseason and, and, and try and understand why. Minnesota hasn't looked as good as they have or as they did last year. You usually don't fall off like that. It's not like they have, I mean, they brought back their quarterback. They brought back a top receiver in the nation. They have still, I think the leading rusher in the nation average yards per game. I don't know that for a fact, but he's got to be top five. I mean, he was averaging 200 and 200 yards a game going into Iowa. So, the Big Ten is in a really, really interesting spot. Indiana, Ohio State will look, will be an incredibly entertaining matchup, hopefully on Saturday. And that is essentially for the East. The West is still technically open because Wisconsin is on, you know, the on the eye test. They're the front runner. But who knows? Purdue now has a loss. Northwestern is probably in the driver's seat. It's, it's going to be hard. Northwestern's now beat Iowa. They've beat Purdue. They are going to play Wisconsin at some point. That's going to be the game. There's, not, there's just not enough games, you know, to really make something happen. I don't know who their crossovers are either, who they have left other than Wisconsin, but should be interesting. And they've proven that they just play solid football. Fat Titch Gerald over there. Played solid football. Let's get to the Hawks. Sorry if you listened through all that and you didn't give a shit. There was no fluff in there. I was just my thoughts on the Big Ten. Again, Iowa wins 35-7. to seven. Did not see it coming. Love it. Another game two weeks in a row where we control the game from start to finish. Incredible to see. Now, it was... Not as 100%. Seven points in the first quarter, real quiet. Seven points in the second quarter. But that fourth quarter, we exploded. And the seven points that they got, those weren't even points, you know? The leading rush attack in the Big Ten, Minnesota, averaging 238 yards per game, finishes the game with 145 yards rushing. So Iowa's defense steps up. Longest carry of the game was only 13 yards. Other than their quarterback, or other than their running back, Ibrahim, who went 33 carries for 144 yards. Good game, no touchdowns. The only other guy who ran, who had running yards, was Tanner Morgan. He had one good running play that got him a first down that kind of hurt, but it ended up not making any kind of difference. He ended up with seven carries, obviously a couple sacks in there, tackles for loss, one yard rushing. Iowa defense doing it again. Jack Campbell out there. 
making plays. Told Josie during the game, we texted him, hey, Jack Campbell's better than you, and so is Seth Benson. They're both way tougher and way better. Love riling him up. And the defense, the defense played great. I mean, Belton. Belton is going to be, I said this on the Instant Reaction podcast, incredible first series. Dude is built. He's got a frame. And like we've talked about, Parker churns out these Tatum Woodson defensive backs of the year, and he's a crossover. He plays this cash position, linebacker. He's got the speed and the agility to run with the receivers in the, in the back end, but he can come up and lay the wood. Fun to watch him play. He's instinctual. Is he the next one? Maybe. Got good play. Good enough play out of our D-line. Nixon continues to do well. Riley Moss. Riley Moss. Uh, so many of you, probably me included, in the beginning were like, God, why is, why, is, is Riley our guy there at the corner spot? But now two weeks in a row, he houses one against Michigan State and almost houses one against Minnesota. Plays the route absolutely perfectly. Which continues to reinforce something that I think is huge, and it's just to trust the coaches. And maybe not in every program can you do that. Maybe not in every program do they have the track record of, but, but why? Why should I trust them? But KF and, this, and these guys, they've been doing it 20 years now. They see Riley Moss, guys like that. They know his ability and who's going to be in the right spot the majority of the time. People are always going to make mistakes. And then on those singular mistakes, people are going to ask, well, why is he the guy in there? Thinking that a backup wouldn't make any mistakes? Let's go to Tyler Goodson. I'm going to play a, uh, a clip real quick from the previous episode about me uh, kind of talking about what I thought Goodson was going to look like this game. Uh, for you two, I'd love to know over under Tyler Goodson, 15 carries. It's got to be over. over that number. I would say with Minnesota's <laughs> rushing defense, over. But... over. Yeah, I don't know, uh, but uh, Makai's got to get his touches too. I don't know. It, it is tough because we, we almost have a committee back there too. And, and I kind of like it. Make T good the 60, 70% of the time back, but like, Take a little off him. I mean, Makai and, and Ivory are no, are no chumps back there. Like, they're doing good work. Um, the way that Tyler plays, though, it's yeah. like he the game is a little bit slower to him. It really is. It you really know, is. he – like, when he just makes things happen that it just doesn't – I don't know. Other people don't. Like he's, Kevin mentioned he's electric. earlier. electric. Yeah, like, like Kevin mentioned earlier, Minnesota, they've given up some big chunk plays. Well, we got a guy that creates big chunk plays, and that's T. Good. I, I could see like three runs of twenty plus from Tyler this weekend. Um, I really, I mean, I think it would be insane to to. I think I think he's got a, a chance to have a special weekend. I really do. That from the last episode one sixty two. I said maybe three three runs of over twenty yards. He had one. 25 yards, I believe, and another of 16 and another of 15. So three runs of 15 yards or more. Pretty decent call there. I also said I like the committee that we have. Give Tyler Goodson 60 to 70% of the carries. Let Ivory Kelly Martin and Makai Sargent take the other 30%. And if you look at the numbers from this game against Minnesota, 30 carries, Tyler Goodson gets 20 of them, 66%, right in the sweet spot that I was talking about. Makai Sargent with nine carries, and then Reganey gets a sweep play, I believe. So it's worked two games in a row. Tyler Goodson goes for 20 carries, 142 yards, two touchdowns, and a long of 45, and has a career night. 
And that made me look really smart because I said, I think he's going to have a special night, but not real deep analysis. Minnesota's rush defense is just God awful. We ran for 235 as a team. And with a couple, without the, you know, if we take away a couple of the negative plays we had, we, we run for just over what they're giving up about 240 a game. So I like it. I like what the offense is doing with the run game. I like the pre snap motion that we're using. I like that we're spreading it out just a little bit more. I like that we're breaking tendencies. We're being a little bit less predictable. The defense. You know, Minnesota, not a, a world beater offense, but the defense in the ultimate bend don't break mode. In fact, kind of thriving the last two games. Going to finish on Spencer Petrus, but real quickly, I want to talk about the special teams. And no, I'm not going to geek out. I won't, I won't do it to you. A lot of people concerned about Keith Duncan. Two weeks in a row. This guy missed three field goals out of 29 last season. I can't remember the stats. 25 of 29 or 26 of 29. Or no, I believe he made 29. 29 of 32 last season or 31. And now I believe he's... Three for five this season? Two for four? He's missed two in consecutive weeks. This one, though not an excuse, doesn't go in off of the foot of a lot of kickers. 50 50 yard distance. 50 yards is kind of like the standard of like, oh, this is a long field goal. Really 45 and back, but when it hits 50, it's like, ugh, not sure on this one. Even in the pros, if you listen, they, you know, their 53 yard field goal for Justin Tucker. And then they get excited when those guys make 50 yarders. Keith is not the strongest kicker, though his leg strength has improved dramatically. We saw Shudak come out and kick a 53 yarder. 53? It might have been 50 or 51. Um, into the wind and miss off the post. And you could see his leg strength and you see it all the time on kickoff. Decided to throw Keith out there on this one. And it was low. It was pushed, right? And it was ugly. A lot of people questioning, hey, is it the snap? Hey, is it the hold? I mean, I got it all this weekend. People really think, hey, man, I've been watching the PAT field goal unit. It's, it's something's wrong with them. Something's wrong with them. The holds have been, I don't, I don't think the holds have been there all year. Snap. It's, 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 it's the timing. Keith's timing is off. On that field goal, everything was just fine. But what wasn't fine was the fact that it was 50 yards away. And that ball is like a rock. When a guy that has to, really put his foot into it to make 50 yards on a perfect day, 75 and sunny. When he kicks a ball in the 30 degree weather, that's 50 yards. He has to do something that's called punching it, right? You have to punch it, which is don't get so much loft. Uh, I believe in golf, it's the equivalent to a stinger, I think is what they call it. Real low off the ground and kind of just gets pushed sideways. And, and that's, that's what you have to do. You have to push it so that you can kind of keep it down out of the top of that wind and you have to get it horizontal quickly. You need to get that distance because if you, if you mess around with it up in the air, it's going to look prettier, but you're not going to be able to kick it as far. It's kind of a delicate process. And when you push it, that's when you open yourself up. You're hitting the ball at a different, uh, in a slightly different spot, slightly different. Uh, I believe a slightly, just ever so slightly different leg swing. And 
that opens you up to more mistakes because it's not your normal. I don't think there's anything wrong with Keith Duncan, although the PAT snap from Austin Spiewak was bad. I jinxed it on Twitter. I apologize. I take full responsibility for it. I said he was snapping great, and what he was doing was awesome, and then he ends up rolling one back. I will tell you this. Snapping in that weather is not easy either. Again, no excuses. You have to find a way to get it done. But that was not good. So those guys have a lot to work on this week, and they'll get it fixed. If it continues to be a problem, we'll talk about it. Spencer Petrus to finish the podcast. Kevin and Drake would tell you that I was high on Spencer Petrus. I've been high. I'm still high on Spencer Petrus, yada, yada. Where am I at now? I think that Spencer flashes and shows that he has the ability to get it done on occasion. That occasion has not been occasional enough. Some of you may argue, but I've seen at least one or two throws each game that show, oh, this guy, that's exactly what we need out of him. That footwork is great. That touch is great. When he needs to fire it in there, that's great. His, his, his uh, decision-making, that's great. But then 60, 70, 80% of the time, he doesn't do that. And the passing game is suffering. Now, granted, we dominated this game on the run. On, you know, there was no reason, no reason to have to be the greatest show on turf against Minnesota. But Petrus finishes 9 of 18. That's 50% for all you math majors. And had 111 yards and one touchdown. And also threw a pick that was bad. A bad pick. QBR of 36.2. Do I still think Pen- Spencer Petrus Spencer Petrus is the guy? For 2020, he is. He is. Because here's here here's why. First of all, you have the COVID background, no spring ball, no summer. Not even sure if you're going to play a season, canceled at one point, postponed. He's only a third year anyway, so it's not like he had, this is his senior year and he had four years of normal prep, you know, so he's had, he hasn't had any like legitimate one reps until they got the go ahead from the big 10. And even if he's not the guy, even if next year we go with somebody else for this year, think about the experience and comfortability that we have behind him. Alex Padilla, who has been in the program one an entire year less than Spencer and has just as many second string reps, just as many second string reps as Spencer has on the first team. So if Spencer's uh, body of work in practice with the first team is not prepared him. What do you, what, why do we think that that same amount of, of work with the second string team would make Alex Padilla ready? It just probably doesn't for this year. And then even further, Deuce Hogan, he's been in the program. He's been in Iowa city for like mm, 10 weeks. And I understand that some places get these guys that can come in. They're physically ready. They can go out and play with the 20, 21, 22 year old, really men at that point physically. I don't know where Deuce Hogan's knowledge of defenses and checks and um, route trees and progressions is. It's obviously at a, at a good level, but you have to learn the system. And he's only had 10 weeks in the system to learn 
and any reps that he's gotten is over with the scout team, which means he's not running our system during the week. I could be wrong. He could be over on the offensive field. That's how this works, right? So if you're not a first or a second string player, usually you're a scout team. You're running the offense of the opponent for the week for the starting defense. Now, I could be wrong. Deuce could be over with the offensive field, splitting the two reps with Alex Padilla. If so, that means that, that, that neither of them have had very much work at all. But there's, there's a strong likelihood that Deuce is over running the scout team. So, so Deuce was essentially, for Michigan State week, Deuce was Rocky Lombardi. He's not even running Iowa plays. He's running the Michigan State plays against the Iowa defense. And he's running them off a card. He's, making, he's having to make no checks. He's having to, he, he lines up, snaps the ball. He's not having to actually make real decisions. Because the scout team is told, be aggressive, try and throw bombs. Try and do stuff that's going to, you know, there's no, there's no penalty or consequence. You're the scout team. If you throw a pick, cool, our starting defense got a pick. Like, no one cares how you do. I just don't think with 10 weeks, Deuce is the guy. Would it be awesome? Where does this go? Would it be awesome if Deuce and Alex and Spencer have the three-way battle of a lifetime starting in January for 2021? Absolutely. That is exactly what we want. Hawkeye Nation should want nothing more than those two guys to push Spencer Petrus for the job. But this season isn't a lost cause. And I think if you throw one of them in at starter, I think we're in some way saying, eh, we don't care. We don't really care. And I also think it's unfair to Spencer, just given that it's an eight-game season with a bowl season slash postseason that is really up in the air. Don't know what that's going to look like, if at all. And an entire year's worth of preparation that was really potentially the worst case scenario for a guy that's stepping into a starting role. I think that's unfair to just give somebody else the job in the middle of an eight-game season. Fairness isn't always what comes through, but this fairness is backed with some sense in it that I don't want to say it, but part of me does wish that like, okay, throw one of them out there. And if they get it done, awesome. Love it. But, you know, just a little bit of me, I, I said it to somebody on Twitter, Hawkeye Nation Twitter account, uh, tagged me in a tweet that was like, why don't we throw Alex Buddy in or something? And they were like, Tyler Kluver, you got this one? And I was like, yeah, trust the coaches. The coaches see the talent. They know what they've got. Recent memory will tell you, and it was in the offseason. It was right away in the offseason. 2015, the start of 2015, KF came out and said, CJ Beathard is our starter. Jake Rudock is the number two. And it ensued that Rudock went on to transfer and go to Michigan, found a different place to play. If Spencer Petrus is our Jake Rudock right now, you guys want the CJ Beathard to be put in. And I don't know for certain, but with my experience of just being around the program, being around starters, non-starters, coaches making decisions, it is my opinion that we do not have a CJ Beathard to our Jake Rudock in our current situation, which sucks. But what are you going to do? We don't just, you know, you don't just get to rub the magic lamp and say, Hey, we're struggling. Give us a quarterback that works. Put Spencer through the fire and let's see what happens at the end of the year. And then we'll have an incredible competition moving into the 2021 season.
leave you with this. I was around KF a lot. A lot of great quotes from that guy, a lot of great stories, many that can't be told. I have maybe never heard such a backhanded, slanderous, but low-key comment that blasted social media on Friday night. It was so good to, first of all, win Floyd six times. PJ Fleck in the boat. It ain't going nowhere against Iowa anytime soon. And as a fan base, it's real nice to just uh, take the pig home and leave the timeouts in Minneapolis. Leave them with PJ Fleck. He can cuddle with them at night. That's it for this episode. Kevin and Drake will be back when they, when they decide that me and you guys are worth his worth their time. We'll talk at you again. Peace.